We are so honored to have Tim Brady, the author of such books as 12 Desperate Miles of Death in San Pedro and His Father's Son. He's written for a wide range of magazines, newspapers, and journals, and helped write and develop television documentaries, including the Peabody Award-winning series, Liberty, the American Revolution for PBS. He also graduated from the Iowa Writers' Workshop. Three Ordinary Girls is the astonishing true story of three fearless female resistors during World War II, whose youth and innocence belied their extraordinary daring in the Nazi-occupied Netherlands. Thank you so much for coming tonight. For thanks, excuse me, Dan. Thanks for, uh, for having me, and, and thanks to Kirk and Boswell Books for, for hosting me. Uh, this is a, a pleasure. I'm, I'm a, another native uh, Wisconsinite, and uh, I grew up in Elroy, Wisconsin, which is over near the Wisconsin Dells, and, and uh, I've gone, I, I'm pretty long removed from there, but, uh, but was, I, I, I'm a University of Wisconsin grad, and the Badgers and Packers remain very close to my heart. So I, I live in, in St. Paul, Minnesota now. But, uh, you'll, for, you'll forgive me. I haven't, uh, I haven't turned colors, uh, even though I've, I've been here now for 30 some years. Three Ordinary Girls is the story of three young women who became fighters in the Dutch resistance after the German invasion of the Netherlands in May 1940. When I call them ordinary, I don't mean, don't mean that they weren't individual, that they didn't have their own unique characteristics, their quirks, their likes and dislikes. Instead, what I want to suggest is how drastic were the changes about to come to their lives. Uh, in, a, in a matter of months, these young women, whose daily lives were typical for young people in North Holland at the start of the German occupation, were about to become integral members of the Dutch resistance and ultimately assassins. They would begin to risk everything that they loved and cherished about uh, in their lives. They would soon be risking their freedom, their families, their very lives to causes that had been largely theoretical to them a few months earlier. Understanding just how and why this happened was the chief animating force behind this book, and in the end became the story itself. Two of the girls were teenage sisters from Harlem, a city not far from Amsterdam in North Holland. Truss, the older of the two, was just 16 years old at the time of the invasion. Freddie, her younger sister, was only 14. Truss is on the right, Freddie on the left. The two had grown up in a working class, politically active household in Harlem. Their father left the family when the girls were quite young, leaving them with their mother, Trenchen, a strong-willed, independent woman, an active member of the local communist party. Family experienced the hardships of the Great Depression as the girls grew up periodically going on the dole to make ends meet. Their education and social lives were wrapped up in the political leanings of their mother, whose friends and acquaintances were largely members of the party. The girls went to summer camps with the children of other leftists. They read inspirational stories of life in the Soviet Union. And from an early age, helped Trincha distribute party newspapers and flyers. Family was also part of a communist founded organization called Red Aid, which assisted refugees from uh, political oppression. As early as 1934, they took in individuals and families from Hitler's Germany, both communists and Jews. The girls were fiercely anti-fascist, fiercely anti-Nazi long before the Germans across the border into the Netherlands. The third ordinary girl, Adi Shah, was born in 1920, which made her a few years older than the sister. She too was raised in Harlem, but had no connections with the Overstegen family prior to the war. Her parents were Peter and Afja Shah. Peter was a teacher at an academy in the city like the Oberstegans, had a strong attraction to socialist politics. 
He wrote occasional essays and articles for Dutch socialist newspapers. The Schaffs had an older daughter, Annie, who died during an outbreak of diphtheria when Annie was just five years old. Annie is, uh, is the taller girl on the left. Annie is the, the smaller girl in, in between all three of them. With the death of the oldest girl, the Schaffs became extremely protective of Annie. The friends and relatives recall her being bundled in layer upon layer of clothing, even in mild weather, to vector against chills. Connie's most distinguishing feature was a flowing head of red hair. It made her conspicuous among her schoolmates, and she was both teased and admired for her mane. The red hair would distinguish her for all her days, even to the Nazis who'd one day pursue. Connie was a good student with a particular interest, like her father, in progressive history. This is Hani in, uh, in, in Harlem, the windmill in Harlem. Is, uh, behind her is uh, not only indicative of the Dutch culture, the Dutch language landscape, but it's still there. Oops. Uh, when it came, came time to go off to college, Hani chose to attend the University of Amsterdam to study law. In Amsterdam, she met some new friends and almost immediately began to feel a sense of freedom beyond her parents' helicoptering style. She soon moved into an apartment, helped found a politically, uh, helped found a club of politically like-minded female friends, including two Jewish girls, who would quickly become among her closest acquaintances. She volunteered to collect donations from refugees for refugees from the civil war in Spain, and when Germany invaded Poland in the fall of 1939, she sent Red Cross parcels to Polish soldiers captured by the invaders. When the Germans arrived in the Netherlands in 1940, the Dutch were ill-prepared for the invasion. They had escaped the brutality of the First World War by declaring their neutrality early in the conflict. Germany had bypassed the country on its way to Belgium and France, and the hope was that they would do so again in the Second War. That didn't happen. Just five days after the Wehrmacht crossed the border, the country was theirs. The Queen and the cabinet of the Dutch Republic fled to London, army surrendered, and in a final act of brutality, uh, the Germans bombed the city of, or oh, this is a shot of the Nazis arrived in Cairo. And in the final act of brutality, the Germans bombed the city of Rotterdam when the Dutch failed to sign their terms of surrender quickly enough. The devastation of Rotterdam was the first indicator of what the air power of the German Luftwaffe could do for a modern European city in the war. The Germans quickly established an occupying government in the, not, in the Netherlands, headed by a bland Nazi bureaucrat named Arthur Zeisenberg. The Nazis tried to put a, uh, oops. The Nazis tried to put a friendly face on the occupation to start expressing their hope that their Dutch cousins would come to see the wisdom of fascist governance. Soon, however, the oppressions of the new regime were revealed, beginning as it usually did with the Nazis, with restrictions on the Jewish population of the Netherlands. Bans on Jews holding public office became bans on Jews in restaurants, movie theaters, and public parks. The registry of Jews followed, and soon after, rough groups of native Dutch fascists began to bully and intimidate Jews in the streets. Inevitably, there was a murderous fight, and one of the fascists was killed in a melee. He was immediately turned into a martyr by the occupiers who cordoned off the Jewish sector of Amsterdam, rounded up 425 Jews, and sent them off to concentration camps. This treatment of its Jewish citizenry had generally shocked the Dutch people. Who had, obviously, who had obviously known of the Gestapo treatment of Jews in Germany and Eastern Europe, but somehow assumed that they wouldn't be so murderous with Dutch Jews. 
to test what was being done, communist laborers organized a strike in February 1949, 41, which would have the distinction being the, the only strike in German in a German occupied country prompted by the treatment of Jews in all of Europe during World War II. The response of the Reich was predictable. Mass arrests, roundups to the camps, and executions followed. The uprising was quelled and the general populace returned to a deeply intimidated town. For some, however, including the three ordinary girls, these actions prompted an altogether different response. It wasn't immediate. They didn't all at once decide to tuck pistols into their overcoats and go looking for SS officers. But in time, they would join growing resistance. They would steal ID documents from the pockets of German soldiers. They would continue to distribute banned newspapers. They would bicycle around North Holland, Oops. Uh, North Holland, spying on the destructions of German batteries and missile sites. This is a blueprint of a B-2 rocket. One of the things that the, the, the girls did was they spied uh, for the resistance out by, by being sent out on uh, looking for, as I said, missile sites and bomb sites. And, and the V-2 rocket, which is the deadly German rocket that was developed late in the war, was, uh, was being fired from near the North Sea in, on the coast of Holland. And they were, and the girls would pedal their bicycles along the shores looking for these sites. And uh, one was in Wassenaar, which was near the, near the Hague. This is, as I say, this is a blueprint of the V2 rocket. They would also disguise themselves as Red Cross nurses to help transport Jewish refugee children from harm's way uh, to safe locations. They would transport weapons between resistance cells. They would place bombs at power plants and sabotage German trains trying to haul Dutch belongings from Holland to Germany. Ultimately, they would lay in wait as potential Nazi targets came into range. And they would pedal their bicycles after them and shoot to kill both German soldiers and Dutch collaborators who were deemed traitors to the country. This is one of those Dutch collaborators, a pilot police officer named Ake Kriest. This last item of distinction is a distinction that should stand out. In Western Europe during World War II, thousands of women's, women participated in acts of resistance against the, against the Nazis on a daily basis. But the number of women, let alone teenagers, who actually picked up weapons and fired them at the enemy was just a fraction of a fraction. These girls were anything but. Ordinary. I'm going to read a few pages from, from the book itself now. So indulge me. I, I, it, I want to give you a sense of if its tenor and of its tone. Uh, uh, this is next slide. This is Franz Vanderveel. Um, Franz Vanderveel was the was the head of the, the resistance cell in Harlem. These are very small cells, especially early in the war. And uh, this is the story of him approaching the girls while joining the cell. Like most sisters, Truce and Freddie did not always get along. Truce, as the older of the two, was more assertive and dictatorial and felt she was entitled to boss Freddie around. Freddie, on the other hand, was eager to display her independence. Freddie had grown into a pretty young woman with her soft curls in her hair, a dimpled chin, and a smile that was both mischievous and petulant. She moved with the lightness of a dancer and flitted about Harlem like a sprite on her bicycle. Truth was more of a tomboy than her younger sister, particularly when she put her hair up under her cap by 
you, you saw those photos earlier of uh, troops that would be handing and going out on, on their expeditions to the troops and put their hair up under their cap. And, and uh, uh, they would go and they would pretend to be a couple as they hiked around the city. Uh, Teresa's manner, mannerisms were like a guy. She would sit with her knees apart, taking more than her share of space on the couch, while Freddie's legs were always carefully crossed and unobtrusive. The truth was that Freddie could be an annoying little sister, a bit of a tag along, and more than willing to let Truce take the lead when it suited her, but better to carpet her decisions later. And Truce could be a bit of a bully with a casual arrogance of big sister. Still, they worked well together, and they were usually of a similar mind on most matters. Like when Franz Vanderbilt showed up to the front door, tall and slim, wearing a fedora and a long overcoat over a jacket and tie, both agreed he uh, had yeah, movie star good looks. It was Trencher who went to the door to snog. She knew who he, who he was through her party connections and immediately let him in. Meanwhile, Truce and Freddie were peeking through the sliding glass doors to the entryway, whispering and elbowing each other. They tried to be cool when their mother opened the doors and introduced him to her daughter. Cross was quite formal, taking off his hat and shaking first Truce's hand and then Freddie's. He introduced himself, and much to Truce's chagrin, she didn't want to see de classe, sat in the lumpiest chair in their living room. She and Freddie were surprised when their mother excused herself and left the girls alone with their guests. The reasons quickly became apparent when Franz announced the purpose of this visit. He was putting together a resistance group in Harlem and had heard from members of the party that Truce and Freddie were intrepid activists. What he had in mind was a lot more subversive, a lot more violent, and a lot more dangerous than anything they had been doing before. Their tasks would include acts of sabotage and use of weapons. He met, mentioned the Russian partisans as, as an example of the sort of organization he had in mind. The first rule of the group would be that they could not read a word of what they were doing anywhere, not even to their mother. In the Soviet Union, women and girls had been fighting the Germans since the invasion began. The Huns typically underestimated women, and the last thing they expected was for young women to be fighting, which would make Truce and Freddie especially valuable to the Dutch cause. Truce and Freddie might be uh, called upon to blow up bridges and trains. They would have to learn how to use a pistol, throw grenades, and detonate bombs. As Franz lit a cigarette and fixed the girls with a sobering stare, he asked, you think you could shoot them? It was an extraordinary question to put to two teenage girls. Then again, with Holland occupied by a foreign nation, the streets filled with black shirted thugs and helmeted Germans roaring around on motorcycles and in sidecars, these are hardly ordinary times. Freddie was first to respond. Never done that before, she heard it out. It was obvious enough. Truce was more circumspect, genuinely considering the question, as if she had been mulling over the possibility for a long time. And in fact, both the overseas and sisters had been reared on the fringes of radical political behavior. They had been part of their mother and father's political lifestyle from infancy. She thought about the day earlier that year when she and a friend, Ari, had been followed. If she had had a weapon and they were being, they had been apprehended by the man in the shadows, what would she have done? Would she have been able to pull the trigger? Yes, she told Franz. She thought she could kill a real fascist, a swine who takes people from their homes to have them executed. She hesitated over other possibilities. Not all German soldiers were Nazis. Franz assured her crisply that in his resistance group, there would be, it would make certain that any executions would be Gestapo and blatant traitors. There would be no mistakes. He mentioned the Gusens, the first Dutch res resistance group. He said that they'd been betrayed from within, that there might be circumstances 
when the girl was going to be asked to take action against a fellow Dutch citizen, a traitor to the cause of the Jew. As for the idea that not all Germans were bad, Franz was almost contemptuous. The Nazis controlled Germany and they had invaded Holland. They actually thought they were being kind to the Dutch, but what was to come would only get worse. They would cut back on liberties. They would reduce food and clothing. They would take everything that wasn't nailed down. The interview came to an end and Franz stood up. The sound of shuffling chairs brought Trencher back to the living room. Acting formal again, Franz tipped his hat and bid the girl's mother adieu. Truce and Freddie walked into the door where he whispered that he'd need an answer in two days. He added an ominous note. Once they were in the group, there would be no turning back. That is the reading. So we do have a few questions. So um, wonderful presentation and then number of people interested in um, your story. Um, the first question was, um, how did you come to learn about the girls? Well, <laughs> interestingly enough, it was through an obituary. Uh, the youngest of the two sisters, Freddie, uh, passed away in September 2018. And her obituary, appeared in the New York Times and the Washington Post. And, and my agent saw the obituary and, and, and alerted me to it. Uh, uh, he knew that I had been looking for a, a resistance subject for my next book. And he said, take a look at this. And, and the obituary uh, was full of all of those sort of headline grabbing elements of the story, teenage, Assassins, Nazi killers, and and all of these uh, all of these elements, and and, and you know, um, care of sisters, and and, uh, and I, I really knew very little about the, the history of the Netherlands, the history of, of the Dutch resistance, any of that stuff prior to to getting the snows. When I when I started, he said, "Why don't we?" You're interested to put together a proposal and, and uh, to do a little research and, and we'll see what happens. I, the more I dug into it, the more interesting and interesting it became and, and I did propose it together and, and we found the publisher. So that's it. in a nutshell, that is how it got off the ground. Um, yes, I don't understand why more, you're not the first person to tell me that their idea for a book was sparked from an obituary. I feel like that's the next time someone asks, and they always do, where do you get your ideas? I'm just gonna cut off the author and say, well, you should be reading the obituaries. Um, that's fascinating. Um, yeah. As a follow-up question from uh, Kimberly Redding, uh, who didn't even know the other one was gonna be asked, she wanted to know, once you got the idea, how did, what kind of um, research was involved in getting the story together? But this is a it was a this was a challenging one for me I, for a number of reasons. I don't speak Dutch. It, it should be uh, stated up front. I mean, and uh, I uh, I quickly learned when I started to do research that there's there's a real dearth of uh, uh, material on the resistance that is translated into English from the Dutch. I mean, there's a lot of uh, Dutch literature on. On the Dutch resistance, but uh, little of it has been translated in, into English. So I, uh, I I had to deal with that, and, and uh, I was lucky enough to find a memoir that Truce, the older sister, wrote. In, uh, in uh, she wrote it in the early '80s, and and it was in fact translated into English in, in the late '90s. But there were there was very hard to come by a copy of that translation. In fact, I did a, a search through WorldCat, which is the, the uh, university that uh, international library systems of uh, our, their catalogs are collected through WorldCat. And uh, I was able to find a 
copy of the, one of four copies of, of the memoir translated was at the University of Pittsburgh, which was not exactly my neighborhood library, but I, I was able to track down that copy and that was of an enormous value. Another uh, source was a, a, a book that was done by a, a, a Dutch journalist from Harlem, which was a biography of Hani, uh, which he wrote in the 70s. That was, was not translated into English, but it had, he was able to collect a lot of interviews of, of, of the girls' contemporaries during the war before they passed away. And so there, there, was, there were a lot of, uh, in his papers I collected that the uh, it's called the Nord Holland Archive in Harlem. I was able to, uh, to access those and, and access the book. And, they, and, they, and they, I can put in a plug for Google Translate here, because that became a, a, a major tool for a number of uh, resources for, for that I was doing. I, but it's anyone who's worked with the, the uh, Google Translate knows it's a, a kind of a painstaking process. You have to take an image, and then and, and, and then it's, and in, an image is an individual page, which becomes very laborious when you, you're looking at the 250 page research material, and you and you want to get every page. You have to you have to take an image of every page, and then use and then translate the. And, and then the translation itself is, is not literature. It's what it is useful for is to get content or facts. You know, it, it, wasn't, you know, it wasn't as if it, it, it was, a, you know, it was the, the language was often jumbled and kind of goofy. It, it, that, so th this is how I, I basically got a lot of my research material research. Mm -hmm. uh, Beth Shadow wants to know. Um, if you know who took the pictures of the girls in disguise? You know, that's a very good question. I've wondered about that too, because, you know, it's not a likely sort of thing that you, that, uh, that you pause in the middle of your resistance work to memorialize it. And, and those, those photos are actually, uh, I think it's, it's pretty obvious that they were taken as, as a way to sort of... Uh, uh, suggest what they were doing and even suggest the illicit nature of what they were doing. They're holding, they're holding IDs and they're in disguise and, and uh, you, you, you know, if you're, if, you're, um, if you're doing surreptitious work, you don't want to be caught you know, um, taking photographs of, of, of you doing this surreptitious work. So it, it, I don't know who took the, the uh, photographs. I would imagine it was uh, um, in the case of the uh, of Connie and Truce, I have a sense that it was probably Freddie, the younger sister, who, who in another, uh, in an anecdote, uh, was, was told, uh, was said to have been a photographer at the, um, the, the event or to have had a camera provided by the resistance cell. She was supposed to be taking uh, images of uh, Nazi or stop the officers. One of our att um, attendees would like to know how well known are the girls in Holland? Connie um, is, is really quite well known. Connie, the, uh, the girl with the red hair, in fact, there was a, a novel that was written in the mid 50s that was a, a very popular Dutch novel called Girl with the Red Hair. Uh, and, and she was, Hani was, I allude to this in, in the presentation, Hani was known and was wanted by the authorities. And, and she was known as the girl with the red hair, was wanted by the authorities, and Christ was put on her capture in her head. And, uh, and she was. The, she became the subject of, of legend, and I don't want to give away too much in the book right now. But uh, um, she she uh, she became a heroic 
post-war figure for the Dutch. And, and as I said, there was a novel written about her exploits and there was subsequently a movie done with the same title and the same subject in the early 80s by a Dutch filmmaker. Actually, we could, I think we can see it on YouTube that we have mind to um, Elizabeth Shapiro would like to know about the significance of the title. Um, she is the daughter of Dutch Jews who survived the war in hiding. Uh, she is, uh, sometimes gives community talks uh -huh. and, uh, called Ordinary, and uh, presentations called Ordinary Heroes. So just how common that sort of turn of phrase is in the Dutch uh, culture. Well, you know, you know I, I don't know if it has any the significance in, in, in a Dutch related sense. I, 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 she may know more than I do about that, but we just chose the title because as I said in the, in the presentation, we wanted to sort of uh, uh, suggest uh, the opposite by, by uh, calling them ordinary. You know, we just, we wanted to suggest the, the, the remarkable uh, lives that they that they had to lead, uh, even though the their, their beginnings were uh, the beginnings in the you know, were ordinary, just just what they had to do was extraordinary. So we uh, we wanted to make a con contrast by understating in, in the title. Even um, Kate Zelensky wants to know if the fact that they were communist leaning impacted how their actions were perceived following the war. Did it take a while for them to get recognized? I, I, I'm reminded of uh, Mildred Fish Harnack from Milwaukee, who, of course, uh, had uh, the, the, you know, after the war wasn't really perceived well because the Nazi collaborator who, uh, you know, because she went to the Soviets for help in addition to the Americans. Uh, That's a very good question. It, was, it, it remains uh, 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 to some extent, to a much lesser extent. The, the, the reception that the communists who were uh, so prevalent in the early days of the, the resistance, uh, the reception that post-war was, was to some extent, a bit of a scandal in the country. Uh, uh, to the communists themselves, the communist survivors, it was a real scandal. Uh, they were, their, their role in the resistance was downplayed. And the Cold War reaction to, uh, to what happened during the war was, was that uh, there was a sense of, uh, of, of a rush to get back to some kind of normalcy. And it normalcy meant that, uh, that, 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 that to some extent that there were that there were more heroes in the resistance than there actually were, and that the, the real heroes were not those those communists like the the, the sisters and Nani who went out and uh, worked as did the dirty work of the resistance. Uh, they were their stories were downplayed, and, and to a certain extent, uh, they, they were lost until a, a renaissance in the, the beginning of the mid seventies and extending into the eighties and up to the present. They today they they their their work and just and by before they died, they, they're, they're, what they did during the war was acknowledged and celebrated by. Like much of the, the Dutch culture and, and politics in the, in the Netherlands. So they did have some, uh, they, they received recognition by the end of their life. And, and there was also recognition, that I, I should mention uh, the, the, the participants of Hani and, uh, um, and, and Trues, and Hadi's parents are all recognized at Yad Vashem in Israel. They, they are, are, are 
the, uh, among the uh, uh, honored there, and uh, they was honored in two ceremonies in 1967, and Church was, Ahani uh, was honored posthumously. Okay, um, I think that is it for our questions. So um, I uh, think we're going to close out the event. So um, thank you so much for a wonderful evening. Thank you to uh, Samantha Abramson and the Holocaust Education Research Cent Resource Center or HERC. Um, thank to all of you for coming because we wouldn't have uh, center programs or uh, a virtual bookstore that is actually open for browsing sometimes with limited capacity uh, without you. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.